My name is Matt, welcome to the shop, and today we are starting episode one of um, the discussion about talk. So, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, you might see me looking down, I've got a few notes to make sure I stay on track. Because <laughs> um, this is a subject that I wanted to cover in multiple videos, I tried to do it in one. Yeah. So, what we're going to do is we're going to literally outline talk and stuff, and we're going to use some analogies the minimum i can get away with and we're also going to use uh, we're going to the deep balls physics of all of this so this first one is i'm going to ask you a question you can think about it you can even pause the video and once i've asked it and type in the comments just put something like i think it's dot 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 and then write what you think it is so the question is i did write this down what provides the locomotion of a motorcycle right cars trains we don't give a shit about that so what provides the locomotion from point a to point b um you know so have i think you know you're probably shouting stuff at the screen you probably know what it is so um some of you might have said something like oh well it's it's the engine you know what i mean air box whatever this, that, and the other. I don't bloody know. There we go, the cylinder head exhaust pipe sticking out. Some of you might have said, oh, it's the engine. The engine provides it. Some of you might have said, oh no, it's the torque. It's the torque from the engine that provides it. Some of you might say, it's the horsepower. It's the rear tyre. It's whatever. So let's actually look at this because this is very interesting. Um, what actually provides from a the, uh, a physics and an engineering point of view. We'll just say physics. Um, so let's just go all hog and let's put a front sprocket and a rear sprocket and a, a wheel and tyre combo. You know what I mean? Let's put a wheel in here. You know, like something like that. That's bad. But you know what I mean? That's the wheel and the tyre and so on. So some of you might have said engine that's what does it some of you might have said well it's actually the torque some of you might have even said it's the force from the piston so I'll just say piston the force that's applied to the piston some people might have said fuel combustion whatever um and some of you might have said the tire the gear ratios whatever some of you might have said, well, it's the torque at the rear wheel, something like that. So let's just do a bit of a, an Einsteinian, <laughs> uh, an Einstein kind of thought experiment. Let's just say that we put this bike, let's put a swing arm in there. Let's just say we put this bike on a paddock stand. Ah, now we have a bit of a problem. You can stick it in gear. You can rev its fucking nuts off, and you are going nowhere, right? You've gone nowhere. So all of a sudden, does that mean the engine, the torque, the piston force, the torque at the rear wheel, blah, blah? Does that mean, you know, at first value, you're not going anywhere? And that brings up the point. What we are missing here is the ground, right? We're missing the ground. That's the big important thing here. So, let's just go a bit further. Um, you know, some people might have said, well, it's the torque at the rear wheel and stuff like that. Well, torque will get to. That's what this entire series is about. Um, but there's an interesting thing about torque. What actually propels you? That's the best word. What actually propels you? Well, you say it's the torque of the rear wheel. It's not that either. Um, and... People have this weird idea about what the actual torque is. So, let's just imagine that in here, right, there's the road surface. Let's just imagine that there's a gap between the tyre and the road surface because we're on this paddock stand. And let's just say that that gap is 10 millimetres. For those imperial folk, forget physics you can't do it you haven't got the right units <laughs> uh, 
in you know in the Victorian age where you live, you don't need to worry about it. But um, let's just say you've got a 10 millimeter gap, and let's just say that we also have a marble. Right, we have a little marble in here, and let's just say that marble is 10.1 millimeters. Right, and we can even put the marble right here, so it's not touching the wheel just yet. Right, right in here, and all I have to do is nudge it ever so slightly. When you do that, what's going to happen? Well, the marble is going to fire out this way. Right, the marble is going to fire out the back, and you'll be going, Well, obviously, yeah, but hang about, we want to go forward. That's a bit strange because we want to go forward and all that has happened is that the rear wheel has accelerated the marble in the wrong direction. Right, it's just accelerated it backwards. That's what's happened. So that therefore means that the force that the engine and all this gubbins mixed together is producing a force that goes backwards right that's just that is what happens you know this is quite a simple thought experiment you know you all would have got, guessed that one quite easily what happens when you roll that little marble in there you can just nudge it it's not about how much uh, acceleration you apply to the marble that tire is going to grab that marble and fire it out just like you fire out a stone or anything like that Pew! off she goes which is an interesting concept it means that your rear wheel here, tyre wheel combo, is applying a force right here at the contact patch backwards. That is where the force is going. And it's because I'm going to sneeze in a minute or what have you. <laughs> um, the force has been applied backwards, not the way we want to go. And this is where Newton's third law comes in. So Newton's third law basically said, paraphrasing massively, because it was in Latin, um, even though the guy was English, um, it basically says, for every force, there is an equal and opposite force. Right? So that's our force, and here's our equal and opposite force. So what that means is, let's just say that this force here is a thousand newtons. Right, let's just say this is a thousand newtons. That means this reactionary force, the opposing force, is a thousand newtons in completely the opposite direction. Along the same plane, so, you know, literally 180 degrees. Which, if you think about it, that's madness, right? Your bike, burning all that fuel and doing all that shit, is trying to apply a force to where you've been. You know what I mean? In the direction of where you're trying to get away from. What's more interesting is how does this then apply this force to the bike? Because the, the, the wheel is applying the force to the ground. And this force is coming from the ground. So this force here is from the ground. So in all purposes in a sense all intent and purposes you can say that the ground is pushing you it's not but you get what i mean this is where some of these things that we're going to discuss in the future and stuff it gets really counterintuitive in a sense and this is just going fucking forward on your bike and we know this is the point we know this is the case because if you put the bike on a paddock stand she doesn't go anywhere Another example of this is let's imagine that this motorbike is kind of like on a dyno. Um, you know, it's on a treadmill. Just say if you've got a treadmill that was big enough and you could ride at the same speed the treadmill was moving, you know, the treadmill is now moving in line with the force. You know what I mean? So the treadmill is, you know, it's coming towards you and you're rolling along at the same speed, it is the same velocity. You don't go anywhere. You know, just like a dyno. You don't go anywhere. You just stay perfectly still in three-dimensional space. You know, you're not going anywhere. And we're talking about locomotion. 
So it is the fact that the road is stationary, the fact that the road is rigid enough that it stays still and you basically move along. What's more interesting is, is where is this force being applied? This force here, where is, you know, where is this being applied? And it's being applied up your swing arm. Now, this is a um, completely separate topic, and you'll notice that I've done a swing arm at an angle. In, it's out of the scope of this video because we're just talking about torque and stuff like that. But the angle of this swing arm, your centre of mass, stuff like that, is actually very, very important. One thing I will just state in this is that means that if you have a bike, let's say, that you know, you've got yourself an R1, Panangali, whatever, you've got a bike that produces 200 horsepower, right? That means that all of that, if you're, you know, you're topping out, <coughs> giving it the fucking beans, all of that horsepower <laughs> is going up your swing arm and through your swing arm bearing, right? That's how it connects to the rest of the machine. You undo that swing arm pivot and obviously suspension. Well, to like I said, that's a totally different discussion. But you just undo your swing arm, right? Or just say you've got a hard tail and you've got an axle. All of that force is going through your axle being transferred up your frame. For a swing arm bike, all of it is going up your swing arm and to these bearings. And how many people have shit swing arm bearings? It basically takes everything of the bike. And this is why you'll find a lot of bikes that actually have the swing arm mount in the engine. You know, it's part of the engine casting or it goes through the engine casting, stuff like that. And this is why on frames, it's very important that that swing arm pivot around there is very well supported, stops it flexing, twisting and so on. This is why in MotoGP and stuff, you'll hear a lot about not just chatter and stuff, but this is why the swing arm is extremely important um, and why you shouldn't chop and cut bits out and fuck around with swing arms too much because this is taking all of it. And actually, because it takes all of it, and this is what we'll get into, it, it kind of defines what you can and can't do with suspension setups on the rear because, you know, it's it's going to have to take a lot of force or it's it's constrained but it's not really in the line of, of of the force that's being applied again totally different video that's something we have to look at you know in a totally different concept a different video basically i want to kind of stick with this and stay on track but just think about it for a second how much your swing arm bearings have to take you know the load they have to take this is why they're big fuck off you know big fuck off um axles you know this is why they have high torque and stuff like that because they are basically they're meant to take a lot of force it takes all of the force all of this force that propels this bike at whatever speed you're going stuff it goes through that swing arm that swing arm pivot bearing basically so it takes an awful lot um now this all might sound mental you know what i mean like oh it's the road and stuff like that but literally without the road or if it's in space or something like that the bike just basically does nothing. Well, if it was in space, it'd start to counter-rotate from all the inertial masses and stuff. But anyway, um, yeah, so without the road, nothing really happens. You know, like you say, you put on a paddock stand, it doesn't fucking go anywhere. I know this is basic at first, but you have to understand some of this stuff. Because when we start looking at other things, like balancing and counter-rotating and flywheel masses and inertia... Un having an understanding of how there has to be it's where the forces are um, applied to and expressed and stuff like that really is important but most people just don't think about it like this at the end of the day if the road uh, it's, it might sound silly if the road wasn't there you wouldn't go anywhere but it is actually the force has actually been applied backwards you know a brilliant way to describe this because it's not really counterintuitive it's just say you go to like the swim baths or the olympic swimmers and stuff they'll swim towards the wall and then they'll push against the wall, they'll put the feet, I'm not going to put my feet on the board, but they'll push against the board and push that way, and they go that way. You are pushing, you know, Hadouken fucking that way into the board, and you end up moving that way, you know. In the next video, we're going to talk about, I've got a little cheat sheet here, what's the next video? Right, in the next video, we're going to talk about dinos and talk. Hope that makes sense, and I'll see you in a bit. And as a little addendum to the end of this video while I clean this board, um, you might say to yourself, well, uh, if that's the case, um, 
you know, or, or another good example of the case is, is if you're on sand or something, you can apply as much uh, throttle as you want to your rear wheel. You will literally fling out sand and mud and shit straight behind you and you won't go anywhere. It is the stiffness of the material you are on. Um, and it's one of the main reasons why riding across water, trying to aquaplane a ride across water, is such a difficult thing to do because it just fucking it isn't stiff it isn't rigid it just collapses it just shifts out the way it just moves and that's one of the problems um with trying to do that uh someone might ask the question you know could you build an engine theoretically or whatever could you build an engine to rotate the earth either faster or slower or start to rotate it out of plane um, the answer in, you know, it's, it's a hypothetical, but the answer is no, not really, because what would happen is, is let's just say you could have infinite traction, you will locally deform the earth that you're stood on, so you'll just ripple the earth, just like basically pushing sand out the back of a dirt bike kind of thing, um, you know, you, the, the earth isn't a rigid body, so it's not solid all the way down to the core, and it's stiffness and so on, um, so... You know it's differentiated so you have the crust you have the mantle you have the outer core and the inner core you could not actually there would be viscous coupling there but you know what i mean you you deform the local ground around you then actually slow down the earth you know or whatever so the whole superman spinning around the earth back time travel anything like that yeah you need mass the reason why you go across the surface of the earth and the fucking earth doesn't really go anywhere um and again, you know, you've got equal and opposite forces. If I rag my bike, is, does that mean it's pushing the earth backwards? Not the earth as entirety. If you wanted to say, maybe you've just shifted a tectonic plate slightly because there's gaps between them. But more than anything, you're just going to locally shift the tarmac underneath you. Even if it's by like three or four widths of an atom. You know what I mean? It's local stuff like that. You're going to just basically move everything a bit. So if we all ride around the earth that way, eastwards or westwards or whatever, we're not going to slow down or speed up the earth. Actually, our mass of every single biker and every single human on one side of the earth would have more of an effect than us actually just revving our engines and trying to speed off that way. <laughs> Hope that makes sense. Bit of a weird one, that one. And I'll see you in a bit.